morning. Good morning, Audacity of Marriage group. Um, I am actually doing a live Facebook broadcast. This is actually a test. We're using a new um, application here. And I'm actually testing it to see how it works. But I wanted to just communicate with you guys because uh, many of you have been a part of the group for a couple of uh, months now, some of you a few weeks, some of you just a few days. And I just wanted to take an opportunity to share with you some of the things that we want to do with this group to make it more interactive. As you know, as a member of the group, you are free to post anything that is related to relationships, whether dating, committed courtship, engagement, or marriage. Um, many of you have your own own space in relationships and you do a lot of great things free feel free to share your blogs your articles any links to any information regarding uh, information that may be advantageous to the members of the group some of you do your own Facebook lives as well or you have videos feel free to post those in the group as long as it is related to relationships it doesn't have to be marriage uh, many of the members in this group are single uh, some of you are in committed courtships but you're not married yet and so all things pertaining to relationships. But what I wanted to do is talk to you about a Q&A series that we want to have. Uh, some of you are looking for clarity in your relationship. You have questions that have gone unanswered. You're searching and searching online, reading articles, uh, watching videos just to figure out how to, uh, I don't know, work something out in your particular relationship. And that is one of the things that we were motivated uh, by in terms of creating this group, to be able to have a platform where we could answer your questions. And this particular video that you're watching here allows you to post a question, and then I can actually share this question on the video screen for everyone else to see, and we can engage in conversation. So I see that there's a, a person on right now. So I'm just testing this out. This is just a test. If you would, could you just post a question? Like what question do you have about relationships? Even if you're in a great relationship, what question do you have that you would like clarity on? Or what question uh, have you discussed with say friends and family that they've always wanted to know and they would like clarity on and you would like to ask that question for them? I'm testing out this platform just to see if it works. So just indulge me. So if you could post a question in the stream, that will be helpful for me. And that way I can interact with you. Uh, and this is something that we want to do on a regular basis. We're going to pick the perfect day of the week and time of the day where we can get the most uh, viewers so that we can have a great user experience. And so great. I see that you have a question. So this uh, application allows us to do something cool. I'm going to post the question. So Kimberly. Kimberly Campbell, why do men play games? And then I'm going to hide the question. Men play games because many women allow them to. Uh-oh, did I just put the blame on women? <laughs> no. no. I was just trying to be controversial. The reality is you have to understand that boys are socialized and acculturated and indoctrinated to believe that their manhood, their maleness, their masculinity is based upon their sexuality. How many women they can please, how many babies they can produce. Uh, um, and so if you grow up with that psychology and if you're in an environment where there are other boys, uh, I say boys not by age, but by maturity, you can be in an environment of other males, let's say, where that is what they do. And it's not about right or wrong. It's about what you're used to. It's about what you're exposed to. So if you're told from a very young age, you know, this is what you do and this is how you treat girls and, you know, your manhood is based upon having as many women as you can have. And you know what? Commitment is played. Get what you can get. Sow your royal oats. You grow up with that mentality and then you begin to live out that mentality in your life. But at the same time, we have to also realize that a, a man can never do to a woman for too long what that woman doesn't allow. Now, there are a lot of men out there that are tricked. That they're, how can I say? They're very deceptive, right? Dece deceitful, excuse me. They lie. They have games. They manipulate. Um, and they take advantage of many women. Uh, and when women peak game, they move on. But unfortunately, there are some women that allow the games to continue uh, for whatever reason. 
And so I think that when games are being played, you must understand that it is a two-way street. I wrote a book entitled "Why We uh, Entitled Black Thighs, Black Guys, and Bedroom Lies. And we talk about the male player of the game, and we talk about the female player of the game. And we talk about how both of them have their roles to play and how they both have an agenda. For instance, the black vagina finder, which is the male player of the game, he's after a woman's vagina. That's all he's interested in, sex. And then you have the female player of the game, which is known as the low pro ho, because all she's after is a man's penis and his possessions. So if you have two individuals that are after what each other has access to, I'm sorry, I'm playing with this, as you can see, it. Kim said yes. <laughs> if you have a man who's just after what a woman has access to, a woman who's after what a man has access to, then that's the game. But guess what? You both lose in the end. And there's no type of sustainable relationship that can come from, from that type of interaction. And we always say that the origin of a thing determines its nature. So if you start off playing games and think that you can develop that into a healthy relationship, it's just not going to work. So, Kim, another question. Is this deceitful? Um, is this deceitful to be a married man on social media with no wedding ring, no pictures of his wife? Uh, absolutely. Unfortunately, I say this all the time. If you're in a relationship, okay, married or not, if you're with someone, there should be rules of engagement to govern that particular relationship. For instance, there's a video that I take all of my clients through. And we talk about social media etiquette. And I think what one of the things that's really hurting relationships today is that anything goes. And we feel like we can do anything we want. And I think that, you know, if we had rules to govern this relationship, it would work. Now, think about this. Uh, a home should have a form of government. In it. A home should have laws in place, because if there are no laws to govern that relationship, then you have a lawless relationship. If it's a lawless relationship, then guess what you have? Anarchy. She wants to do what she wants to do. He wants to do what he wants to do. And it's not about the unit. It's not about the family, the marriage, the structure. It's about each other's own individual uh, desires. And oftentimes that can work against a successful relationship. So if a dude is on Facebook, much like a woman, because there's women who do this as well, and they give the impression that they are single, but they're not, that's deceptive. That is a problem. And so I always give general ground rules to say that if you're in a relationship, you should post that. You know, you should add that to the status. If you're married, you should add that to your status. I mean, you can even link your partner's or your spouse's page to your status so people can even see who your spouse is. You know, I encourage people all the time that you should not be having private messaging with members of the opposite sex that are uh, where you're engaging in conversations that are inappropriate. You know, there have been times when people have inboxed me and I put them on blast quick because I wanted to make an announcement to the world uh, that, that I wasn't down with that. And that if you were thinking of coming at me in that particular way, it would not work. And so as a result of that, people don't really do that uh, anymore. And so technology is a way for people to hide their mess. Now, technology is not going to make you something you're not. It's going to make you a bigger version of what you already are. So if you're deceptive, then technology allows you to do that to a higher degree and on a higher level. If you're not deceptive and you operate in integrity, technology can't strip you of your integrity. <laughs> Does that make sense? And so um, if they have a problem being decept deceitful online, they probably have a problem being deceitful offline. So I hope that answers your questions. Continue to send your questions in or make your comments because I'm actually testing this thing out. I see that we have five viewers. Cool. Let me see, post this. Kim said true. Thank you, Kim. Now, let me tell you something. For all of those who don't know Kim, Kim Love Jones is a relationship expert and she talks to singles. And she has a phenomenal book that she just produced. She was just in, um, uh, she just had a book signing at Barnes and Nobles. Uh, this woman is so bad that she has even been uh, invited by TED Talk uh, next year in March 2018 to do a presentation in New York City, which I think is amazing because people have spent years, I mean years, trying to get on TED Talk, but because of her commitment in this space, uh, and her consistency in this space, they sought her out. So we just want to give congratulations to Kim. All right, Kimberly, you're on the roll. I love it. Um, why do married men chase single women? Because a lot of married men aren't marriage minded. A lot of married men don't have the philosophy that, you know what, once I've entered into a 
a, a relationship, it comes with a sense of monogamy, fidelity, uh, security. And a lot of men have the mentality, you know what, this is my wife and this is my mistress. And I believe that I can have it all. And I think that's problematic. And so that's why I think it's very, very important that you really take the time to get to know the person that you're dating before you even make the decision to move to that next level. I often talk about the four seasons of a successful relationship. You have the dating season, you have committed courtship, you have engagement, and you have marriage. And so with each season comes a different level of responsibility, of commitment, uh, of obligation. And through that process, like for instance, when you get into the committed courtship phase, you should really take the time to get to know who that person is, right? You should know their mentality. Are they single-minded in their approach? Are they marriage material? Uh, we, I think it's important to have working operational definitions for things. So as a couple, what do we think about fidelity? What do we think about commitment? What is our definition of infidelity? You know, you know, what is a trust in a relationship? Like these are conversations you need to have. I wrote a book called Intellectual uh, Intimacy, Questions for Couples and Couples to Be. And the reason why this book is so important is that it covers uh, areas that you may not have discussed prior to. So we talk about sex. We talk about romance. We talk about work. We talk about careers and we talk about finances. We talk about God. We talk about religion. We talk about childhood upbringing. We talk about chores and responsibilities. We talk about family planning. All these things are discussed. Why? Because you don't want to get into a marriage just because you love someone. Because let me tell you something, love is great, but love won't make a marriage work. Even the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that a house is built by wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And so it's important to realize that it takes certain skills to make a relationship work, and it takes certain skills to make a marriage work. Did I just say marriage and relationship? Yes, because they're not synonymous. They're two completely different things. So when you're talking about a relationship, you're talking about sexual fulfillment, uh, meeting each other's emotional needs. You're talking about uh, effective communication, uh, the blending of personalities. And so there are certain skills, right, or knowledge that's required to for, for that to work well with a couple. But when you're dealing with your marriage, you're dealing with financial planning, the management of the home, parenting, uh, preparation for your future. It's a whole nother host of skills. And so there are many people who have great relationships. They have an emotional connection, heartfelt, but a horrible marriage. Things aren't in order. House is out of order. No finances in place. No, this, no security. There's some people who have a great marriage, money in the bank, kids are taken care of, you know, clean home, uh, vacations, all of those things, but there's no relationship, right? They've gone from being soulmates to roommates to roommates. So it's important to know that they're two different things. They require two different skills. So the person you say I do to should be pretty adequate. You know, no one has to be perfect, but they should be pretty adequate in those particular areas. Kim says, do you think that they do this because they have nothing to lose because they're already married? Do I think that they do what? Not quite sure what you mean, uh, but I think, it, it, you know, from what I gather from your question, what I think is that a lot of times when once the chase is over and I got you, I'm good. So I can fall back. I don't have to I don't have to put on a full court press and do uh, what I initially did to get you. But my philosophy is whatever you did to get that person is what you're going to have to do to keep that person. You know, does that make sense? So if you were dating before you said I do, you got to date after you say I do. If you were communicating well before I do, then you got to communicate in order to maintain that relationship. I think a lot of us get into relationships uh, or select who we want to be with based upon two criteria, physical attraction and emotional desirability. So as long as you look good and you can make me feel good, then it's all good. But that's not right. That may be enough to initiate a relationship, but not enough to maintain a relationship. So it requires other skill sets as we've just talked about. So in the book, The Audacity of Marriage, is a chapter entitled, uh, Dwell with Your Spouse According to Knowledge. The more you know who that person is, the more you begin to realize what makes them tick. Now you know how to operate in a, a relationship with that individual successfully. I think that even though we've been together for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, some of us 30 years, we've been operating on autopilot. Many of us have been on cruise control. 
and we're just living life, but we're not experiencing life. We're not taking the time to build up that emotional connection. We're not engaging with one another. We're just two passengers in a journey together, and we become oblivious to ourselves and to our partner. And see, that's how the relationship gets stale, and that's how things begin to um, kind of wither away over the course of time. So I hope that answers your question. We have a question from Nicole. Can a marriage survive if the couple have a good marriage, but not so much a good relationship. Unfortunately, many marriages, that's all they do is just survive. We're not interested in your marriage surviving. We're interested in your marriage thriving, you being successful, you having a new lease on life. This is no diss, but I say this all the time. When it comes to ministries and when it comes to churches and when it comes to even organizations or practices, that work with married couples, their main objective is to save the marriage. And I just think that that's so low level. Like that's step one. How many people do you know whose marriage may have been saved, but they're miserable, right? They're miserable in their marriage. And so all we have is what? Kids. All we have together is what? Time. All we have together is what? A house and a couple of dollars in the bank, but then that's it. And so <laughs> what's holding us together? What's binding us together? What's the glue that creates the intimacy? There's no spiritual intimacy. We don't pray together. We don't worship together. We don't do any of that. There's no sexual intimacy. Yeah, okay, we have sex, but there's no intimacy in our sexual experience. It's just something we do. Uh, like, I don't know, um, dishes, check, grocery shopping, check, sex, check. It's just something we do. And so we're missing the level of intimacy that we need. We don't communicate. We don't date. We don't do anything. So, yes, we're married. We're husband and wife. We have titles, but we don't have real relationship. So, yes, your marriage can survive with no relationship, but you want your marriage to thrive. So focusing on those particular areas will allow you to do that. And I don't mean to be a promoter and a promoter and a promoter, but I don't have the opportunity of working with every couple. Unfortunately, I just don't. I don't have the time or it may be a financial issue. And so that's why I put this book together, because literally I have spent, listen, I've been doing what I've been doing for 17 years. I put 17 years worth of wisdom and counsel and knowledge and, and all types of information in this book to give you what you need. And my thing is this, if you just read the book and do what it tells you to do, it will work. And so I wrote this book in a very practical way that, that, that gives you instructions on how to make your relationship work. Thank you, cuz. Speak the truth. I'm trying. All right, I think I have another question. Oh, I already answered that. Let's go to the next one. All right. Thanks, Kim. She's flowing with them today. Why do men act like they are afraid to leave a marriage, but they will, I don't know. Why do men act like they are afraid to leave a marriage, but will they, I guess? I don't know. I don't understand the question. If you could repost that, Kim. Um, I will answer that. Okay, not sure where you're going with that. Um, all I know is that when it comes to relationships, you know, oh, okay, why do they cheat? So let me read the question. Why do men act like they're afraid to leave, but they cheat? Well, let me just say this. <clears throat> I think this is important to understand. Let me get rid of that. Okay, very good. <sighs> There are two things that we're dealing with, two laws. I need you to understand this. Now, this is deep. There's the law of attraction and there's the law of attachment. OK, when you first initiated the relationship, the law of attraction was alive and well. Right. So you naturally did things. There was a connection. There was sexual energy. There was all these different things that brought you together. That was the glue. But what happens is monogamy turns into monotony and eh, that's just my wife, that's just my husband. And then we begin to drift off because we're attracted to what? Newness. So now we begin to engage in conversations with someone else. So now we have a level of attraction that we no longer have with our spouse. So we drift off into a relationship, into an affair, into something that's sexual or emotional and not appropriate. But yet we're not willing to leave. Why? We're not willing to leave because of the law of attachment. Well, what is the law of attachment? Well, my finances are attached to my marriage with her. My children are attached to her. My, 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 my lifestyle is attached to her. My reputation is attached to her. 
my group of friends, my environment, everything I know, we've been together for 20, 30 years, is attached to her. So though there's no attraction, there's still an attachment. And people will stay in a marriage because of the law of attachment, but will venture off and have relationships with others because of the law of attraction. And so it's important that you learn to have both within your union, attraction and attachment. Those two super glues will ensure that you have fidelity in your relationship. I hope that makes sense the way I explain that. But this is good. This is good. I appreciate your questions. Uh, any other questions that I can answer? I hope uh, is this making sense? Feel free to give me a comment whether this is making sense or not. Let's see what she says. Break it down. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. That's my cousin Dana from Jersey. Had the chance to see her last week. Good to see sis. Um, but that's what we want to do. So what we want to do is have a weekly session where we just answer any and all questions. It's like a free fall. But if you could tell me what day of the week and what time of the day would be best for you to be available for you to engage in this type of conversation, um, if we were to do this on a weekly basis. Um, like for instance, every single Monday at 9 p.m., as you know, we do our infidelity recovery call, but not everyone has experienced infidelity. There's so many other issues pertaining to relationships that we would like to deal with. So I'm just trying to figure out what the sweet spot is. Um, we have another question. Why, I'm sorry, what does work look like in a marriage? What does work look like in a marriage? Okay, if I understand that correctly. Uh, the same amount of effort and attention that you put into your career, the same amount of effort and attention that some people put into their education or they put into uh, being physically fit as they go to the gym and as they focus on their nutrition, is the same amount of work that you've got to put into your marriage, right? It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. If you have a heart and a desire for it to work, it's going to take time and effort and consistency. And so a marriage is no different than any other area in life. For some reason, we think that a marriage is just supposed to work, that things should just be easy, that we should just be able to get along. Well, I don't know why you would think that. That is not consistent with any other experience we've had in life. So I don't know why you would think that it would just happen in marriage. And I think many people give up, cave in and quit, throw in the towel, call it quits and, and, and get divorced because they have the wrong perception of what marriage really is. I say all the time, marriage is spelled W-O-R-K, it's work. It requires work. And if you're not willing to put in the work, it's not going to work. So I tell people all the time, it'll work if you work it. So what does work look like? Maybe for you, it means developing your communication skills. Maybe for you, it means clearly defining roles, responsibilities, and expectations in the home so that there's clarity, so that there's some sense of order and structure in the household. Maybe it's for you making a decision to date more because you don't have the time to do that. Maybe for you, it's taking a class on parenting or reading a book and figuring out what to do to really bring order and structure into the lives of your children. You've got to kind of look at your situation and figure out where you're lacking uh, where things aren't really working and seek the answer out. I say this all the time. You've got to be careful where you get your advice from. Many people wind up getting their advice from the wrong people. You go to people who have what you want and who have been where you've been. Like I wouldn't learn how to live you know, a, a healthy life and, get, and lose weight from somebody who's obese. It, it just doesn't make any sense. I wouldn't take a million dollar idea to somebody who makes $35,000 a year. It doesn't make any sense. But we have a tendency of sharing our problems with people who share our problems and rather go into people who represent and have our answer and solution. We go to other people who represent our problem. And it doesn't make any sense. We get caught up in personalities as opposed to people's profession. I'd rather go to an expert who specializes in a particular thing than somebody who has a popular blog. All right, or a popular television show, but their lifestyle is not consistent with their personality. It just doesn't make any sense. So you got to be careful where you go to get your information. And I think that if you go to the right sources and if you're teachable, things will work. At the end of the day, there's something called a teachability index. The teachability index says on a scale of one to 10, what is your willingness to learn? Okay, on a scale of one to 10, one being the least, 10 being the most. What is your willingness to learn? And then the second question is, what is your willingness to accept change on a scale of one to 10? One being the least, 10 being the most. If 
if you don't have high numbers and your willingness to learn and your willingness to change, you don't have a high teachability index. So no matter what I tell you, it's not going to work. I could talk to you till I'm blue in the face. It's not going to work. You can read every book you want. Now, you've obtained information, but it ain't working because you ain't doing nothing with it. So at the end of the day, if you're not willing to make changes in your life, then you're not going to have any changes in your marriage. And on that note, I will say you can't change your partner. So stop trying to do it. As long as you point the finger, there are three fingers pointing back at you. So you've got to realize that if I really want my spouse to change, I got to change me. Because think about it. You are in a marriage or in a relationship and where your relationship is, you may fault your partner all you want, but you're a part of it. So you've been complicit to it. You've gone along with it. You've accommodated it whatever the case may be. And if you want the pattern to change, then you've got to break the pattern. Your partner's not going to break the pattern because of your request. Only you can break the pattern. So once I change me and I do something different because I made an internal vow within myself to do something different and I'm still with my partner, my partner notices my difference. My partner has to respond differently to me because I made a difference within myself. So changing me changes how my partner responds to me, thus changing my partner. Does that make sense? So if you want to change your partner, focus by changing yourself first. All right, so let me go to another question. I see him coming in. Tanya, my sister Tanya, what's going on, girl? It's been forever. Uh, why some spouses don't keep up their appearance? Why do many become complacent? Yeah, I understand. I, I I I can admit, you know, when you're married and you're with somebody for a long time, I guess the thrill is gone. If, when you were dating, you put your best foot forward, right? You made sure you look good, you smell good, you made sure you came out stepping because you wanted to make a great impression. You put your, your best foot forward. That represented the best of who you are. But what happens is once you get into a relationship and normalcy takes in or takes over, you no longer have the desire. So you walk around the house looking bummy. You ain't brushing your hair. You're not brushing your teeth. You're looking scrappy. You're looking homey because you're like, you know, she know who I am. I wake up with her. My breath stinks. So there's a sense of normalcy uh, that takes place and the newness has been gone. I think many of us, unfortunately, have fallen into that rut. Not all of us. But I think it's, it's time uh, that you begin to reevaluate because at the end of the day, listen, you're always competing for the partner that you're with at the end of the day, because unless you live on an island and there are no other options, there's so many other people out there that are gaining the attention of your partner or doing things that you no longer do, which could cause a problem or vulnerability in that relationship. And if your partner saying, listen, uh, clean yourself up, let's go, let's date, let's do things different, let's bring excitement back into the relationship, and you're not willing to do it, and you're just, you know, willing to sit back and just live life, and not really, you know, you're surviving, but you're not really living, it's going to cause a problem, and that's how relationships get stale, and so, you know what, you have to secure a date night, where you say, you know what, I'm going to dress up for my partner, I'm going to put on my best, I'm going to wear my cologne. I'm going to get that new outfit. I'm going to tease my man or tease my woman. And I'm going to bring back the level of attraction and intensity that we once had. That is so vitally important. And, and just know, appearance is not just a, a men's issue. It's a women's issue as well. Meaning, we say that men are visual and we're attracted to what we see. Well, women are as well. It is important that both of us are putting our be best foot forward as much as we can to gain the eye of our spouse because we can lose it if we don't do what's necessary and required. So hope that answers your question, uh, Tanya. Wow, they're coming in. Give me a second. Can't believe it. Another question. Can men have an emotional attachment to another person be considered cheating? Well, cheating is more than just penetration. Treat cheating as anything that you would not do that you did, don't want your partner to know about. So there's four types of an affair really quickly. There's the one night stand, there's emotional entanglement, uh, there's sexual compulsion, and then there's the marital void, which leads to long-term relationships. So I have counseled a couple who's been married for 40 years. Of that 40-year marriage, the husband was in a 25-year emotional affair, never physically was present in the same room with this other woman never had sex with this woman, but they lived hundreds of miles away, but they maintained a relationship through the phone, uh, through uh, email, through mail, 
So when holidays came around, they gave each other gifts. He would buy two sets of gifts, two sets of cards, and they had an emotional connection stronger than uh, the one that he had with his wife. And this devastated her. And, you know, a lot of people think, well, it's still sex is no big deal. It's a huge deal. Um, because if you have somebody else has your heart and someone else has your mind and you're checked out of the relationship, yeah, you may physically be there, but mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, you're somewhere else and you're connected to someone else. That is devastating to a relationship. And so when we talk about monogamy, it's not just physical, sexual monogamy. It's emotional monogamy. It's maintaining that you put up the proper boundaries and borders to protect the sanctity of that relationship. Remember, relationship versus marriage. You can be married and have no relationship. You can have relationships with other people. The key is to understand that your marriage is your primary relationship. And that's where you should put your greatest investment in. And the emotional piece is really everything. So I hope that answers your question. A couple more and then we're gonna bounce. I hope that this is helpful. Dana, I see a question from you. What advice do you have for couples that what advice do you have for couples that different argument styles? Uh, one wants to address every issue at the moment when the other wants to hear the issue and, and then take time to come back and calmly talk things through. Every couple is different, and that's why it's important to have rules of engagement. You know, oftentimes we talk about the two personalities in most relationships. You have the peacekeepers and the peacemakers. The peacekeepers are those who sweep issues under the carpet. They don't want to deal with it now. They'd rather deal with it later. I don't want to talk about it because I know if we do, it's going to wind up being a fight. We're going to wind up arguing. And I just want to avoid the conflict and just maintain peace. But then you have the peacemakers. The peacemakers want peace as well, but they'll do anything to get it. They will fight and go to war to get the peace that they want. And whatever issue we're dealing with, we need to address it right now. I don't care who's around. I don't care who's looking at us. I don't care where we're at. This is important to me. It needs to be important to you. And I'm willing to fight to get the piece that I want. See how they're opposite, they're extremes. And when two people are operating in their extremes, you both lose. So you have to learn how to kind of meet in the middle so that the peacekeeper and the peacemaker aren't getting their way, but they're willing to negotiate through this thing. And that's why it's important to establish rules of engagement for communication. Rules of engagement says, all right, listen, let's take the time to address the issue, right? Because we're not going to brush it off and act like it doesn't exist. But let's define the proper time. Let's define the proper place. Let's define the amount of time that we're going to give in a particular session to this issue. Because three hours later, we're still talking. I'm already checked out. So now I'm yawning. I'm exhausted. It's two o'clock in the morning. I got to get up at four hours and you mad that I'm not alert. But wait, I got to work. Like this ain't the right time and place. So once you put certain rules of engagement in place, it allows you to really have healthy, productive, mutually beneficial uh, interactions with each other where you can deal with issues and resolve them. At the end of the day, most people have issues that never get resolved because their style of communication gets in the way. The three components of communication are your words. Your words are 7% of your communication, what you say. Your tonality is 23% of your communication, how you say what you say, and your facial expressions, body language, and gestures, 70% of your communication. And so the reality is, I can't hear what you're saying because of the way you're saying it, or the face that you have, your body language. You know, it's just like if I said to you, I love you. Was that convincing? No. You heard my words. But the messaging of my tone and the messaging of my body language said something completely different than the words that I spoke. And so oftentimes we think because we're, we can articulate and we can clearly explain that we're great communicators. That doesn't make you a great communicator because there are other components that you have to keep in mind that have to be brought into, per, per, uh, that need to be brought into balance for the communication to work. And if you haven't focused on those particular areas, you're gonna have a problem. You know what I'm saying? And so sometimes we could be demeaning. Sometimes we can have a sharp tongue. Sometimes our, our body language can be dismissive. Sometimes even the rolling of our eyes, the sucking of our teeth, come on, the, the way in which we deliver what we, well, I'm just gonna keep it real. You know, I don't believe in pussyfooting around. I'm just gonna tell it like it is. See, already you're messed up. 
I can't receive what you're saying because you don't even care about how the message comes out. So you've got to be responsible in the way in which you communicate. I know that this was an issue for me. I did it in ignorance. I'd say things, not think about how I was saying things. And the message was coming out of my mouth, but the messaging attached to the message was not received because of the way in which I did it. So hopefully that helps and gives you some clarity. Listen, guys, I want to thank you uh, for joining me for the last, I don't know how long, the last 30 minutes. This was a test. Um, I hope that you got something out of it. If you don't mind, post in this uh, in this stream what day of the week, what time of the day would be good to have like a weekly a Q&A session where we can answer all of your questions because we want to do it regularly and not randomly so that most people get the most uh, impact out of this experience. Once again, get the book. If you don't have it, you're missing out. It's an excellent book. I'm not saying that just because I wrote the book. I read it too. It's really good. But on that note, guys, I want to thank you. Uh, one thing that's coming up that Danielle and I are doing, we're going to have a weekly Facebook Live called Married to the Business. If you are a couple and you are in business together, or if one of the two is in business together and their spouse supports them in any way, you want to be a part of this weekly call that we're going to do or broadcast, I should say, that we're going to do because we're going to be sharing so much phenomenal information. Now, if you enjoy what I do, you're going to love Danielle. I am like a rat's nostrils worth of, of intelligence, of articulation and knowledge in comparison to Danielle. That's the true one right there. You know, I, I, I stumble, mumble and fumble through all that I do, hoping to give you something. But that's that's the goal. That's that's the one right there. So when we come together, we're able to do something powerful. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, that's going to be on Thursday, I believe. So definitely tune in for that. Uh, we are launching the well, we've already launched, but we're going to be opening up enrollment for the couples business school. Um, we have a couple of courses and programs coming out. So we look forward to sharing that with you as well. But nonetheless, thank you for uh, taking the time. And if you have any questions or anything that you would like to be discussed in our next Q&A session, inbox me and I'll get that information right over to you. Or we'll set it up for another live call. Talk to you soon, guys. Take care. Thanks, babe.